This is our podcast. We've been asked to do this by the British Hip Society as part of their legacy series. The idea behind here is to give a uh, background for our audience regarding the Birmingham hip resurfacing, its development, the problems, the advantages of it, where it sits in the you know, use for surgeons at the moment, and then look forward to other developments going forward in terms of hip resurfacing. So my name is Callum McBride, I'm a consultant orthopaedic surgeon. The panel today includes Ronan Tracy, Sarah McMinn, and Roger Ashton, uh, engineer, who's been involved throughout all of the developments. So we're going to start off with uh, Derek McMinn here. Derek, why was there a need for hip resurfacing? With the essential lesion being loss of a couple of millimetres of articular cartilage in the femoral head and cup, it was inevitable that a surgeon stroke engineer would reach to coating the femoral head and the cup with prosthetic materials. And the first to do that was Sir John Charney in the 1950s. And he used Teflon on Teflon. It only lasted a few months, unfortunately. And what happened was that two layers of Teflon bound together and cup and head moved as one grinding against the acetabulum, producing lots of particular delivery. We had Wagner, Freeman, Amstutz, and some others come yeah. in with metal or ceramic on conventional polyethylene. That didn't work. We did the Wagner in Birmingham, and at uh, five to six years, we had a 50% failure rate. Total hips didn't do well in young people either. The Swedish register at the time showed a 20% revision rate at uh, 10 years in patients under the age of 55. The Charnley total hip replacement was published by Cho Shi and others from Wrightington, and they presented the 20 year results of the Charnley total hip replacement in patients under the age of 40. And they broke down their patients by diagnosis. The lowest activity patients had rheumatoid arthritis, and they did quite well. So they had a 96% implant survival at 20 years. But the normal activity patients with osteoarthritis had a 51% implant survival at 20 years. So conventional polyethylene didn't work at all with hip resurfacing. And with a 22 millimeter Charlie head, it only worked in low activity patients. So why metal on metal? My predecessors had done metal-on-metal metal, uh, hip replacement in Birmingham since uh, 1966. Max Harrison did the first in Key Farrar. Then came the ring, and one of the surgeons was allergic to cement, Robert Duke, and he did uh, the ring on cemented hip through his whole career. The Stanmore was mainly done by a surgeon called Robbie Sneath. So we had experience with three different large-headed metal-on-metal toe lips and Ronan and I saw these patients at 20 years. Plus, x-rays looked great and the patients had been functioning normally. And this was totally different to our Wagner resurfacing series. So here we had large heads with metal on metal. And it seemed obvious to me that the right thing to do would be to pair metal on metal and hip resurfacing together to have some chance of getting a viable hip resurfacing. Now, in those early days, one of the issues or one of the difficulties is fixation. So tell me a little bit about the iterations that you went through. I didn't know what the best fixation on the cup was, what the best fixation on the femoral component was, and nobody I asked, and I asked all the greats in hip resurfacing at that time, could tell me what was the best. And so we tried press fit, no coating on the head, and cup and cement on the head and the cup and hydroxyapatite on the head and the cup and at the end of that we knew that cemented heads were best there were no failures we knew that hydroxyapatite coated cups were best no failures of that group so uh, we went forward with the current hybrid and during 1994 and 1995 I did over 100 patients, and at 10 years, they had a 96% implant survival. But it all went to pot 
during 1996 because the manufacturer decided to double heat treat the metal with hot isocytic pressing and solution heat treatment. And these are processes that are generally used in cast stemmed implants mm. to get rid of porosity and minimize fracture. But they are absolutely deleterious for a metal on metal bearing. And they either deplete or totally get rid of the wear resistors, the carbides in the metal structure, which are essential for a well-functioning metal on metal bearing. Was there a feeling or did you feel that there may be a problem with metal allergy or metal on metal wear? Did you think it was going to be a problem? Because clearly it's now become a problem. The problem is limited in my own series. For example, in the BHR series, which started in 1997, uncemented cup, porous and hydroxyapatite, cemented femoral component. In my women, age 50 and under, with primary osteoarthritis, they have a 99.1% implant survival at 21 years. Metal reactions? Not. Men? Not quite so good, but pretty good. 98.5% implant survival, 21 years. Men over the age of 50, they were almost as good as the men under the age of 50. Mm. They did really well. Women over the age of 50, not good at all and i discovered a new problem with metal on metal we described published on and it's nickel allergy and the working hypothesis is if women use cheap jewelry for many years they will eventually get nickel sensitivity and if you put a metal metal joint into them that releases nickel into the soft tissues and into the blood and we can measure it then a proportion of those will get a nickel sensitivity reaction and fail. Now in Oxford they discovered a new mechanism of failure also and the key was their six-year publication on just over 600 joints. We trained three surgeons from Oxford and on the publication the surgery was done by 36 surgeons. 30 of them were trainees. For the BHR how critical is training and accurate implantation of the implants. Accurate implantation is key and I persuaded David Murray to send the retrievals of his BHRs to Smith and Nephew, Roger and Amir Kamali, uh, analysed them blind, he mixed them in with non pseudotumor reasons for failure and when the code was broken there was a direct relationship between edge wear of the cup and pseudo tumor. This was the disease discovered in Oxford. The original part of your question was, you know, when were you first aware of metal or metal type problems? And I think it, it really came in two phases and it, and it might surprise you. Our initial awareness of metal type problems was with metallosis in the mid to late 90s. Certainly from my perspective, you know, during the late 90s and early noughties, the only thing I was really looking out for was metallosis, which we hardly ever saw. But what we subsequently saw a decade later was a rash of papers, you know, from 2007, 2008 onwards, which was about metal ions, which was a, a different issue. So that was my perception of events at that time, and I, and I didn't see the pseudo-tumour issue on the horizon. So in terms of dealing with those potentially separate but interlinked issues, Eric, between metallosis, metal debris, but also high metal ions, in hindsight, what could have been done better with the BHR to minimise that? It all boils down to surgeon implantation. If you put it in well, none of these problems will happen. The only one that hit me was nickel allergy in mm. older women. And that's where I believe metal on metal does not mm. have a place. If we look at the, the wider population of surgeons who are putting in the BHR, there's obviously been an issue with the smaller sizes of the women. But clearly, metal on metal resurfacing is not going to be available for that group. Just tell me about the advantages that you've made more recently in terms of looking at a new design and why you've come to that. 
Well, of course, we've gone to metal on cross-link polyethylene, and uh, I really wish that in 1991 I had started with a cross-link polyethylene rather than metal on metal. In 1991, when I started, I was completely unaware that actually at that time a viable cross-link polyethylene existed. The first I knew about it was a publication from Professor Michael Blesky from Whitington with his 10-year results of 22 heads on cross-link polyethylene. He was the president of the British Hip Society when I was the secretary, and we talked a lot. And he gave me great encouragement to keep going and perfect metal-on-metal -metal resurfacing, but he didn't tell me about cross-link polyethylene. So I asked him, why didn't you tell me? And uh, he said, well, in the early days, we saw high initial penetration of the head into the cup, and we were initially worried that unlike what we saw on the hip simulator, we might be having increased wear. So uh, I asked him, why, when you saw that this was creep and not wear, and that was clearly shown on the 10-year, and later the 17-year, and later the 28-year publication, all in the JBGS, on the same series of patients. The wear went to zero and stayed at zero. It was phenomenal. So this is metal on highly cross-linked? No, it was actually ceramic on a oh. highly cross-linked. And that was an issue in itself because it was a luminous ceramic and you can't put an alumina onto a cone fitting because it will burst if it's a 22 millimeter. So the genius engineer who discovered, perfected the cross-link polyethylene also worked out a solution where he put a 0.2 millimeter layer of polyethylene between the trunnion and the inside of the ceramic head and not one of them failed. Amazing. However, I asked Mike, why didn't you go back to it when you found out that the wear was phenomenally low? And I didn't get a good answer. That didn't make me happy at all. And so I eventually found the brilliant engineer who developed Crosslink Polyethylene, and I have interviewed him on video. And his name is Dr. Martin Eloy, and he sought to develop a low-cost highly cross-linked polyethylene cup that was injection moldable. Conventional polyethylene is not injection moldable. It was chemically cross-linked and it had got an antioxidant in it. It was uh, hindered amine, one of the Organox family. So this had got everything. This guy was so far ahead of his time it wasn't true. I said, I've seen the publications. Why was it stopped? And he told me the really sad story of Charles F. Thackeray Company, who, of course, made Charlie's total hip replacement. And they were bought out by Dupuy in 1990. And he told me that the Dupuy people visited all the various departments of Thackeray's. He asked them about his cross-link polyethylene, and he told them the Dupuy representatives informed him that they had been working with DuPont and they had developed the best polyethylene in the world and his crosslink polyethylene was to go in the bin. So that's why it wasn't done. Just for interest, the name of the best polyethylene in the world that they thought of was Hylamer and we all know how badly that did. That was a tragedy for surgeons and even a tragedy for patients because patients were deprived of an almost zero wearing polyethylene at a time when osteolysis started to go wild. It was over 10 years before cross-linked polyethylene that was radiation cross-linked became available to the orthopedic surgeon public and patients. That was a big negative. And so that's where you now move forward to using it in polymotion. It's radiation cross-linked, but with an antioxidant, only this time, vitamin E. Okay, great. So, going to Roman there, obviously you've been there throughout, and Eric has his perspective on the Birmingham hip and the challenges and the problems that have been overcome and dealt with. What were your thoughts on some of the comments or answers that 
Derek made. Uh, well, of course, you know, I was in awe of Derek because I was his uh, registrar. It's my very first registrar job in 1990 or 1991. And I came to work for the great Derek McMinn and I really didn't understand the difference between link, ling, ring. <laughs> it was all very confusing for me. And you have to remember, you know, in 1990, 1991, the gold standard is a Charlie total hip replacement. North of Birmingham, it's done through a trochanteric osteotomy, and south of Birmingham, it's done you know, with an anterolateral approach, and that's the gold standard. It was a very interesting time to be uh, in orthopedics and joint replacement because society was changing. <laughs> we're just beginning to get the internet. Uh, people we were getting mobile phones. People were becoming more uh, connected. And I think the biggest boost for Derek and I at that time was really that we did most of our surgery through uh, the posterior approach. And uh, whilst it was perceived to be an approach where your patients had a higher dislocation rate, uh, your patients didn't limp. Most of our colleagues were using the anterolateral approach and patients and people were perceiving a difference with our patients and their patients. You know, to have a younger patient without a limp uh, is a great advantage. What were your thoughts about why the BHR grew so quickly? I think the biggest battle was probably within the first five or six years between 1991 to 1998 because everybody had said that resurfacing couldn't work because of femoral head avascular necrosis. And uh, we became gradually aware that this in fact wasn't the case, that it was a result of debris, not as a result of a biological defect of, of blood supply through the approach. So for the first five years, I think dispelling the myth that the heads were all going to collapse and it, it just couldn't work. Um, and of course, there were various iterations. I think there were about five different iterations of the of prototypes uh, prior to the Birmingham. And really, it was all about fixation, which was confusing to begin with. But as Derek said, uh, he had the ability to go through uh, different iterations of fixation fairly rapidly. How much do you think was the, the growth in BHR down to the, the implant itself, to the surgeons becoming aware of it as an option, to patients driving it, like you mentioned the internet? Yeah, was it a bit of everything? Or do you think, yeah, I, I think about this a lot. I think it was a bit of everything, but you know, I, I, I think the, the patient relationship with uh, the medical world changed in that time. So. You know, in the early 1990s, the surgeon was always right. Um, he told the patient what they were going to have, and that was the end of it. And of course, as communication improves, uh, patients understand they do have rights, and they do have opinions, and they have aspirations. And to be told you're going to have a joint replacement, but you're never going to work again, you're never going to climb a ladder again, and there are various sports that you're never going to engage in, just wasn't what they wanted to hear. I think patients became rightfully more demanding of them. What are the bad aspects to the growth? Because it grew so exponentially, that would have had some negative effects. We definitely chose experienced surgeons, but of course that model isn't sustainable if you want to operate on uh, 10 to 20 percent of the nation's uh, patients. The other thing of course we did is we insisted that every surgeon who was going to take the implant on was trained by us. And during the lifetime of modern medical technologies, we stuck to that. Most surgeons who really wanted to have a conservative operation work in their hands, mm -hmm. they were happy to be trained by us. And we supplied videos to them on a blow by blow. How do you do this? How do you not damage the muscles mm -hmm. yet? get a great exposure so there's no issue with component fixation and component placement. So talking about that cohort, so Van der Straten has published on that, so Ren, just tell me about your thoughts then, what that paper represents. Well, um, the Van der Straten paper, um, in case anybody hasn't seen it, uh, is in HIP International, it was published 18 months ago, it was a cohort of 11,000 patients, all under the age of 50. There were 27, I think, surgeons involved from the 
four different continents. The results she showed in the most difficult group of all un under 50 year old patients. Uh, the males were three to four percent failure rates with the Birmingham Act uh, 20 years, and the females not far behind. So, following on from that, then, Brendan and, and Eric, as well, do you feel that metal on metal resurfacing should be limited to a certain surgeon cohort group and or a certain patient cohort group as it is at the moment? By one way or another, it is actually limited to a certain patient group at the moment because of the manufactured sizes um, and so uh, in general we can't implant metal metal devices into female patients in female sizes and there are difficulties if you do uh, certainly in the UK th th that's already occurred but clearly the, the metal on metal results in the, in the larger male patients are outstanding. Going back to then when you uh, had and I was at those meetings when there was a a lot of scepticism about your both of your results you know you stand up at a meeting and you would get a degree of scepticism from the audience and a, and a degree of animosity and certainly being challenged about it and how did you deal with that and how do you feel the profession as a group dealt with that yeah i think it was a very difficult time i, I think the saving grace certainly for me and i guess for derek as well is that we've just done so many thousands and not seen a problem. Derek historically has followed up his patients rather better than I have, but I'm saved by the joint registry. So from 2003, all of mine went into the joint registry. And uh, we had a very good handle on who survived and who failed. And you know, the results were really very pleasing. It became tiresome from 2008 onwards because it's like living in a parallel universe, you know, why can I do an operation and get good results and somebody else 50 miles down the road has disastrous results with the same implant and am I, you know, a denier? And I didn't put them all in straight, I'm, I'm afraid to say, and I understand about cut positions much better now than I did 15 or 20 years ago. And I think everybody with total hip replacement now understands about cut position and edge wear and you know, that's why we have robots, etc. So despite all the evidence that there is for the VHR, certainly in your hands, there's been a decline. Clearly there's been a massive decline in the use of the VHR internationally. But do you think then it's still a safe implant to use? And if so, in what patient group? Yeah, well, well, of course, I am a believer, but I'd say it's the safest implant to use because you'll know there have been some papers. There was one by Derek and myself in the DMJ, uh, which showed that Birmingham was safer than a total hip replacement and much safer for mortality compared with a cemented hip. Clearly, people were sceptical because it came from Birmingham again. And the professorial unit in Oxford repeated the paper and we found that the results were even more pronounced. It's not really referred to a great deal, and, I, and, and I, I'm surprised at that because we're very aware of safety for patients, uh, for marginal gains in, in other fields, and this is, you know, a, a bit of a showstopper because the differences are so marked. The cohorts in these groups are enormous, mm -hmm. and the numbers of confounders are also enormous. Mm -hmm. The confounders have been, you know, figured into the, uh, the final outcomes and, and the, the outcomes remain different. So I'm very happy to put a metal on metal hip resurfacing. Clearly I have a metal iron type of conversation with them, but I mean high metal ions in a male patient in a well put in implant, few and far between. Now that brings us on to the, the where we are now and you're a co-developer of the polymotion hip resurfacing. So tell me what advantages do you think then a polymotion hip resurfacing in your view? have over what's already available? Well the, the principal view and the most strikingly obvious thing is there are no metal ions to contend with. You know we can talk to we're blue in the face about how good our Birmingham results are at 25 years but it really won't cut much ice with somebody who has a fear of metal ions. We have to acknowledge that you know the, the margin for error in putting a, a hard on hard bearing in smaller sizes is less than it is in larger sizes and I believe that polymotion allows us a wider margin for error and a 
softer landing, if you like, if there is a problem than the metal on metal situation. If you have to revise one of these, put your sharp reamer in and you ream it out, if that's what you want to do. Um, clearly that's not an option with a metal on metal Birmingham, which can be difficult to get out. Roger, so you're an engineer who's been involved a long time through the Birmingham hip and now obviously with polymotion, but you've also been very much involved in retrieval work. Tell me about the retrievals that you've seen. It's been quite a privileged position. There is a resounding message from retrievals that wear is a function of where the bearing contact position is in the device. That's where the head operates within the cup. And obviously that's a function in broadest terms of how the cup's placed and uh, antiversion and uh, inclination. But it's also a function of impingement effect. And it has been possible to see a lower level message associated with the impingement of the device and its effect on wear. Because when the contact position starts to stray towards the edge of the device, you start to see elevated wear. But as it strays further, you start to see more pronounced effects of, uh, of edge wear, where the, the lubrication breaks down on the devices. That's a message. It's also a message of, of the design of the device in terms of coverage of the device, because looking at various devices, not necessarily confined to VHR, you can see the impact of that, particularly with the, with the ASR, mm. because in certain stages, of its life, it would have features that, that reduce the amount of air that's available. From a, a positive point of view, from a VHR goggles, obviously in its largest sizes, it's always going to be a play off between coverage of the cup over the head in terms of the bearing coverage, mm. and that's a play off against range of motion. But from a VHR's point of view, it's especially in the large sizes, mm. you know, it's, a, it's been a very positive feature that it means that those uh, des design rules and the implantation rules and the expectations on the device are mm. pretty well, well armoured. So in the smaller sizes then, the tolerances for implantation are tighter? Um, yeah, Is so that... so in the smaller sizes, it's, it's the choice of the designer of this, which depends on how you set up the relationship between small sizes and large sizes. It happens that the VHR had a little bit of an adverse relationship which meant that the smaller sizes suffered in terms of the amount of bearing angle available. It's possible to do something about that within the confines of a resurfacing design, you know? Mm -hmm. And obviously that's something that's being looked at now. Uh, that's something that's obviously being looked at very closely mm -hmm. and adopted. The um, severe adverse reactions, reinforcing Derek's point, almost always associated with a measurable edge wear. So how important then is correct implantation for the longevity of the bearing of, of a VHR or indeed any resurfacing? Let's just talk from a metal on metal point of view. The, the retrievals remind us that metal on metal bearings work best in a lubricated condition. So anything that threatens that leads to elevated wear. So mm -hmm. if you've got some impingement, you get to edge wear, it starts to threaten that uh, benign lubrication condition and you're into truly uh, abrasion or adhesion types of wear and things that threaten it are obviously attitude, impingement, laxity and the like. So, so from a, if one can start to look at uh, a bearing combination that is less dependent on those fluids and lubrication conditions and one that is particularly proven to be reasonable in a, uh, in a more point loading situation which happens consistently for example in the knee Mm. You know, where you start to get line contact and the, the materials behave well in line, in line contact. But still key to, even then, to put it in right. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Mm. So the main point is that uh, elevating wear will, will bring the, uh, in a metal metal situation, will, you know, bring the relationship between the patient and the device to an end one way or another. The device won't have failed particularly. So from a, from a metal and poly point of view, one is obviously um, looking to, to have uh, failure or an increase in a much more benign fashion, which you're looking for benign modes mm. of, uh, of wear and uh, you want longevity, but you also want possibility of a benign failure in the, most, mm. in the most adverse situation. Moving to the polymotion and its design, with resurfacing there's obviously challenges in bone conservation and fixation, as we heard with mm. the development of the Birmingham hip in terms of acetabular fixation. 
but now you've got a poly. Tell me about the difficulties or the challenges that you've had, or the biggest challenge to overcome in the design perspective to get a poly cut to work. I was thinking for the, the constraints on the resurfacing, and just as you, you, you mentioned, you're working in that uh, much more confined zone between head size that is applicable, you know, dictated by various parts of the femoral anatomy, and the amount of bone stock available to be able to add a, a, an acetabular device onto the head side. So the challenge is to work in that much more confined zone. Our challenge particularly has been to be able to get uh, good and immediate fixation, but preserve the amount of bearing material available and to, to be able to do that on a polyethylene substrate. So that has been the challenge within that space constraint to, to be able to provide on the cup side particularly a good amount of bearing material for maximum resilience, immediate fixation, uh, good gription after the device is implanted, good possibility for, for bone growth but also let's look at the benign failure side mm -hmm. of this, what we don't want is to limit the amount of polyethylene available to us in, mm -hmm. in, in order to maximise the amount of wear that is possible but we don't want a, a hard modular connection within that cup provide us later on with a, a catastrophic possibility of failure. And hopefully that's what we you mm -hmm. feel that we've found with the mm -hmm. found with the polymer. That's actually. what we've been pushing towards on the problem. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I'm just gonna ask the panel the each a question. Resurfacing devices now being trialed, yeah, for different bearing combinations, in particular ceramic and ceramic and the different designs of that resurfacing. Start Ronan, Derek, and then Roger. What advice would you offer to other designers, surgeons who are exploring new resurfacing concepts? Great question. I think they're not going to get it right first time. There's only so many things you can change all at once. I think Birmingham hip resurfacing is the gold standard in hip resurfacing. And any departure from that should be an incremental departure. And we've seen disasters, you know, with the ASR where you changed maybe six different features on it. So my advice to any uh, potential resurfacing designers is if you're going to make a massive departure from what's gone on before, uh, don't expect to get it right first time. Okay, Derek, advice to your co-designers out there? The object of uh, hip resurfacing is to give the patient a good, useful, high-activity lifestyle. And at the end of its lifetime, we want to be left with a femur that can easily be used for fitting a double hip stem. But most importantly, and a lot of surgeons forget this, we need an acetabular. And so it's no good saying, oh yes, I've done a hip resurfacing and preserved the femur. If you ream half the cup away, particularly if you ream half the cup away, you put in a rigid cup that causes stress shielding one day one day that patient is going to need a revision and you do need sufficient acetabular bone left a thought to the revision absolutely a thought to the revision and if you're not prepared to save the acetabulum don't do a hip resurfacing Good. great uh, roger advice to the uh, other engineers out there and we're resurfacing head should have a stem as well. Yeah, you're after looking right through the lifetime of the patient. You want to have some possibilities. Okay, but that's Can I come back on one of Roger's? Yes. Uh, he was talking about the joint reaction force and the wear zone and its relationship to the edge of the cup. The soft tissues have an influence also on the direction of load of the acetabular component. I'm obsessed about not hurting the soft tissues. I've tried to train surgeons to do the operation without damaging the soft tissues. Don't hurt the soft tissues. A, if you do, it'll send the resultant force more vertical, break the muscles, and you will get heterotopic ossification in young people. Ask any pelvic fracture surgeon and they will tell you damage the gluteus minimus and that is a recipe for heterotopic ossification. 
So, yeah, and that applies obviously to resurfacing and total hip replacement. So, another question, perhaps I'll start with you this time, Barry. In light of that, what you've just said, in light of what we've all heard, what do you feel are the three biggest advantages of hip resurfacing over total hip replacement? Overwhelmingly, the first advantage that was identified first by us and then fully explored by Oxford. I've criticised what's gone on in Oxford enough, but what they did on the mortality study was absolutely brilliant. I presented on a much lower mortality with resurfacing versus total hip replacement. And the Oxford fellows uh, approached me after I gave a talk and several meetings, and they seemed to indicate that we didn't have enough confounding factors for the statisticians to adjust for. I agreed because our statisticians wanted more and more and more confounding factors. We had gender, we had age, and diagnosis. We, we did have diagnosis. The one different one was we had ASA grade. So the Oxford people went away and they set about deliberately, not just repeating the study, but finding every conceivable confounding factor known to man. And they adjusted for all that. The lowest mortality was hip resurfacing at 10 years. The highest mortality, adjusted for everything, everything known to man, was cemented total hip replacement, slightly bettered by uncemented total hip. But hip resurfacing was way out there on its own Thanks. after correcting for everything. Six and a half percent lower death rate. Okay, so one advantage, yes. second advantage. The conservative nature of the joint replacement, mm. provided it's done with due care and attention, downsizing the femoral head to retain acetabular bone stock. So don't ream away the acetabulum, don't stress shield the acetabulum. Third advantage? Better function. Roger. Restoration of anatomy. Yeah. Any others? The ability to fill the joint space correctly. That last one needs yeah. to be explored. Okay. Filling the joint space correctly. Jonathan Jeffers from Imperial College London has explored this extensively. He has alluded to the importance of the joint capsule. If you have a large head and a present femoral neck, then the capsule pulleys over the head and the top of the neck and pushes the head into the acetabular. And so it's not surprising that there's a dislocation advantage of hip resurfacing mm -hmm. compared to total hip replacement. Australian Register, one in a thousand. Lander Stratton series, one in a thousand. Mm. Until recently, total hip replacement, 3% dislocation rate. So that's 30 in a thousand versus one in a thousand. However, total hips have improved a bit. Why have they improved? Because we can now use cross link polyethylene. Mm. That means we can now use large femoral heads without excessive polyethylene wear. But Jonathan Jefferson's studies have shown that if you use the same head size and you compare hip resurfacing versus dual mobility, same head size against a cup, then there's better stability with hip resurfacing compared to dual mobility. Ronan, advantages? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be slightly ethereal on this because you know, clearly the dislocation rates lower patients sort of like the feel of it. Uh, you preserve certainly the femoral bone stock and hopefully the pretty similar in the acetabulum. You know, I, I, I've treated thousands of these patients over 25 years. And I, I think the difference between this and a regular hip is hope. I think it gives the patients hope because it means it's not the end of their lives as they know it. They're going to go back to all the things they were doing five years ago. They're not all going to start behaving like their mothers and fathers or grandmothers, and they are still youthful. They carry on 
earning money to pay for a mortgage, go skiing, play tennis. By far and away for me, it's hope. And, you know, when you see a patient for the first time with osteoarthritis and you tell them they're going to have a joint replacement, mm -hmm. it's a much softer landing for them when you say, well, actually, we're going to do a resurfacing. We're not going to do a total hip replacement because with a total hip, they envisage part of their anatomy has been amputated, whereas they uh, they have all sorts of different words for resurfacing, like, like re-scraping mm -hmm. or whatever. But we know resurfacing is reshaping as well as resurfacing but in the patient's perception it's that it's the same as having a crown on their tooth rather than an implant scraping the barrel now after the boys have had a go but you know <laughs> uh, it's harder to get the leg length wrong mm -hmm. yeah um, uh, i think they bruise more in the first couple of weeks following surgery but after the first two weeks i think they overtake the total hips and their recovery mm. but for me it's aspiration and hope. Okay, great. So last question, uh, which is a short answer for each of the panel. 10 years from now, uh, and we'll start with Roger, and then Ronan, and then Derek, what percentage of hip arthroplasty in the world do you think will be performed using a resurfacing device? One so of our answers is 10%. 15%. Derek? When I found out that hip resurfacing had a much lower death rate and total hip replacement, the patients I was referred, I made an effort to do hip resurfacing on them. I can resurface almost all men. Mm -hmm. I can resurface half of the women. So it would not surprise me if surgeons one day saw the light and moved hip resurfacing up to 40%. Excellent. So thank you very much. That's been absolutely brilliant. So thank you very much to the panel for giving me your time and answering those questions today. Thank you very much.